Welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha, a podcast shared by David Roylance. This podcast is dedicated to guiding you to completely eliminate the discontent mind and the suffering it causes by attaining enlightenment. Learn and practice the teachings of Gotama Buddha that will guide you to fully attain a peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy. To support this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha or visit buddhadailywisdom.com where you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online learning resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Now, here's our teacher to share more. Sawadikap, hello and welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha. Thank you for joining us today for our Pali Canon and English study group where we study the words of the Buddha. We're moving into a new book today. This is volume eight. It's titled The Foremost Householders. We're going to be studying chapters one through 10. And if this is the first time that you've joined us, there's no worries because we're actually going to be displaying the chapters on the screen and reading them as part of today's class. Then I'm going to be sharing teachings on each one of the chapters and open up to any questions that you guys might have. If you've been joining us for a while or you plan to join us in the future, then that means you can download the books or order printed copies of them or take the file and go print it yourself and read prior to class if you like. Then you can come to class with any questions that you might have on that chapter. I suggest you study maybe one or two chapters per day. This way you're just kind of studying 15, 20 minutes a day, just a little tiny bite because it's easier to digest that way. Whereas if you sat down and tried to read the entire 10 chapters, it would take you about an hour, hour and a half to do that. And then the reflection and all of that, it's a much bigger dose, a much bigger bite, and it's much more challenging to digest that way. So if you just read one or two chapters a day, maybe 15 or 20 minutes, then you have a full 24 hours or so to really reflect and start practicing that teachings and see that it's actually the truth and how it's benefiting your life. So as we go through this book and all the other books in this program, that's what I suggest for you. This particular book that we're starting today, The Foremost Householders, this is a collection of teachings of the Buddha that have been gathered from all the different volumes of the Pali Canon related to household practitioners. There's ordained practitioners and there's household practitioners as part of this path to enlightenment. And all of us are working to attain enlightenment and have various obstacles and challenges to overcome. But there's also certain benefits associated with each of the different lifestyles. There's another book as part of this series, which has a lot of teachings devoted to the ordained practitioners, which is volume 12. It's titled The Lowly Arts. But really, the teachings that the Buddha shares is really applicable to many different people. These teachings that are in the book of the foremost householders, even ordained practitioners, would gain value from these teachings. There's teachings here related to things like how to deal with physical pain and you know, how to accumulate wealth, for example, for household practitioners, how to be sure wealth is spent well. And even as an ordained practitioner, things like this are going to need to be taught from ordained practitioners to household practitioners. So there's things in here specifically for household practitioners, but ordained practitioners would find benefit for their own practice. And also if they're sharing the teachings with household practitioners, this would really help ordained practitioners to develop their wisdom around these teachings to then be able to share them with household practitioners. So thank you all for joining for today's class. We're going to move into our meditation, which is how we start each one of these classes. We'll just do a brief meditation. I don't usually do much guidance as part of this because the students who join this class tend to be a little bit further along in their meditation practice. So I don't usually do as much guidance. And we just do a very brief meditation as a way to clear the mind and prepare it for the class. By clearing out your mind before learning, you'll actually find that you're going to retain the teachings for longer. So even though we do this as part of the class, you can actually do this before reading as well. You can just meditate for 10 or 15 minutes before you read in your daily life. And you still might have your longer meditation sessions in the morning and the evening for maybe 30 minutes or more, maybe one in the middle of the day. This is just kind of like a little top up. 
You know, you could do a five or 10 minute meditation either before reading, before having a in-depth conversation that's going to be really impactful or really important before you go into a business meeting or things like this. It can be really helpful for you to prepare the mind for whatever it is that you're encountering. And you don't need to do necessarily a full 30 minutes every time. Those are your anchor points that you might do in the morning and the evening. But then you can do these little top ups like what we're going to do now. So if you'd like to go ahead and take a position seated, standing or lying, make the lower body comfortable, the upper body with the hands and arms comfortable. The upper body should be nice and erect. And now just close the eyes and start breathing in through the nose and out through the nose. I'm going to do some chanting to ease us into meditation and you're welcome to join with the chanting, especially if you've learned these already and you're practicing them. You can practice them right along with me and then we'll go into some meditation. Potang mahaka wanang api wate mi Sawakato mahaka wata tammo Damang namasami Supati pano mahakawato Sawakasangho Sanghang namami Napmorha sabhakawato Arahato is a massa Arahato Sama Samputasa Iti Piso Mahakawa Arahang Sama Samoto We Chacharanang Samuro Sakato roka wito Anu pero purisa Dama sati sata tawa manu sanang Poto should just be breathing in through the nose and out through the nose. Establish a nice, steady, consistent breath. Your breath isn't going to necessarily sync up to the guidance that I'm providing. This is your practice. It's your time to do the work to train the mind. So wherever you get to the next in-breath, just breathe in gradually through the nose experiencing the full breath. Notice the gap between the in-breath and the out-breath. And then a nice gradual exhale through the nose. And once again, notice the gap between the exhale and the inhale. Breathing in and 
Notice the gap and the exhale. Focus the mind on the breath. If the mind moves off the sound of the breath or the sensation of air coming into the nose, cut that off, let it go, and come back to the breath. Breathing in and out.
to come out of meditation we're going to move into our class where we're going to study volume 8 chapters 1 through 10 as I mentioned at the beginning of the class the way that we do this is a volunteer will volunteer to read the chapter then I'll share any teachings on that chapter and then from there you guys are welcome to ask any questions that you like the way that you ask questions is you put that into Facebook YouTube or zoom our moderators will see that and then they'll be able to make sure your question gets asked during the class. If you're in Zoom, you can electronically raise your hand and ask any questions or follow-up questions directly. So I'll just turn things over to all of you, specifically our moderators, so that we can progress through class. I go to church. A household life is crowded and dusty. Monk, here a Tathagata, appears in the world, accomplished fully enlightened, perfect in true wisdom and conduct, suburb, knower of worlds, incomparable leader of persons to be tamed, teacher of gods and humans, enlightened, fortunate. He declares this world with its gods, its maras, and its brahmas, this generation with its ascetics and brahmins, its princes and its people, which he has himself realized with direct knowledge experience. He teaches the teachings, God in the beginning, God in the middle, and God in the end, with the right meaning and phrasing, and he reveals a holy life that is entirely perfect and pure. A householder or householder's son, or one born in some other clan, hears these teachings. On hearing the teachings, he acquires confidence in the Tathagata, Possessing that confidence, he considers thus, household life is crowded and dusty. Life gone forth is wide open. 
It is not easy while living in a home to lead the holy life entirely perfect and pure as a polished shell. Suppose I shave off my hair and beard, put on the yellow robe, and go forth from the home life into homelessness. All right. Thank you, Bassam. Here are a few things to talk about. Of course, the overall excerpt from the Pali Canon is talking about how it's really challenging in the household life to live a life that an enlightened being. He's not saying that it's impossible. He's just saying it's quite challenging. And that's why he chose, the Buddha chose, to move into homelessness or to ordain in order to reach to enlightenment and then dedicate the rest of his life to sharing teachings. So if the Buddha thought or he knew that it was impossible for a household practitioner to attain enlightenment, he would have said that right here. He would have said, it's impossible for a household practitioner to attain enlightenment. Therefore, everyone needs to ordain in order to attain enlightenment. This is a myth that's part of Buddhist communities all throughout the world as they think that a household practitioner can attain enlightenment. And I can share with you, this is 100% false. And you can see that here in the Buddha's words. He's just saying that essentially that it's more challenging, it's more difficult because there's a lot more obstacles to overcome. You end up spending your, a lot of your time handling household affairs like going to work, having a career, taking care of a family, taking care of the house. Nowadays, we take care of cars, but back during the lifetime of the Buddha, they had horses and carts and things like this. That was their mode of transportation. They had to cultivate food and other things like this. I would say that during the lifetime of the Buddha, it was much more challenging for a household practitioner to attain enlightenment than it is today. Because during the lifetime of the Buddha, they had to grow their own food. They had to cultivate their own food. They had lots of household chores. Nowadays, 2,500 years later, we've figured out a lot of that stuff. We've systematized a lot of that stuff. Our health care is better. Our home life is better. Even though we've kind of filled it up with things like internet and TV and things like this, that kind of shows you that we do have time, but we tend to fill our time in the household life with a lot of entertainment these days. But if you take away that stuff, at least to a certain degree, and you really focus on learning and practicing the teachings, you're going to see that you have an enormous amount of time in your life that didn't exist during the lifetime of the Buddha because they were too busy with just trying to sustain their life, you know, cultivating food and things like this. So here the Buddha is essentially saying that household life is very challenging to attain enlightenment. But I would share that nowadays there's a lot of that that has been cleared up and there's not as many obstacles nowadays for a householder as there was during the lifetime of the Buddha. Even ordaining, there are certain obstacles for someone to overcome in order to attain enlightenment. So both lifestyles, whether it's an ordained practitioner or a household practitioner, has certain challenges and has certain benefits associated with those lifestyles. And it doesn't mean that somebody has to be a household practitioner their whole life. It doesn't mean they have to be ordained their whole life. These two lifestyles are there for a reason and serve very important purposes. The ordained lifestyle is a way to kind of be in this womb, kind of this mother's womb, where you have a community of people around you that are regularly meditating, regularly studying the teachings. You don't have a career. You don't have a boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, children, a house to take care of. You don't have to go out and work for clothing and food and these other things. You just really dedicate your life to, or at least a portion of your life, to learning and practicing the teachings. But there in that life, you have challenges as well because the discipline that was taught to the ordained practitioners is quite rigid and quite strict. And that's really challenging for some ordained practitioners, especially when you first ordain. So there's definitely challenges there. And then in the household life, there's the challenges of, like I mentioned, career, taking care of domestic things like family, life partners, a dwelling, a transportation, things like this. But the beauty is, is that you have more freedom. You can really, you know, make a lot of choices on your own. But yet, if you don't have self-discipline, this can really be challenging for you because in the ordained lifestyle, 
there's a certain kind of discipline that's built in and there's a community of people around you that are waking up at the same time. They're meditating, they're chanting, they're learning the teachings, they're doing temple duties in the evening. They're all meditating together. They're learning from the master monk or master female ordained practitioner at that temple. There's just a whole lot more space for you to learn and practice the teachings where in the household life you really need to have this inner discipline in order to be successful if you're complacent either in the ordained lifestyle or the household lifestyle it's going to be an obstacle for you but there's a tendency in the household lifestyle to be more complacent so you really need to overcome that to be successful in the household life another thing that you can kind of put to the side that you might hear in certain Buddhist communities and certain venues is people say that the Buddha denied the existence of God or that he never taught that God existed. Well, here you can see just one of many places where the Buddha is actually talking about that he is the teacher of gods and humans. Here he's saying that he's declaring this world with its gods essentially describing the world is what he's saying here. He's explaining the five realms and explaining this being of God, this being of Mara, which some people might refer to as the devil or Satan or something like this, this kind of dark entity, this being that is only interested in causing unwholesome results in the world. And then it's Brahmas are all the different types of gods. During the lifetime of the Buddha, they referred to this supreme god this great god of brahma which was like the great god but then they had these other gods that they believed in as well nowadays with the teachings of jesus christ we've come to realize that there's only one god but during the lifetime of the buddha they believed in multiple gods so the buddha was discussing this and helping them understand this so here you can also see the buddha talking about that he teaches teachings that are good in the beginning good in the middle and good in the end. This is where when a teacher is delivering these teachings, they shouldn't start off good and then kind of fade out over time and kind of leave their students kind of, you know, with not many detailed teachings. A teacher should have developed their mind well enough that they can teach for an extended period of time where the teachings are good in the beginning, middle and end, and they're not fading. That they don't start off low and then kind of build up and then kind of fade off or they don't start off great and then kind of fade off but instead they're delivering well delivered teachings with really good word choices and phrases to penetrate into the mind of their students so the students can deeply understand what it is they're teaching that's why the buddha says here with right meaning and phrasing if teachers are complacent with our words and we're not diligent in our word choices, then they don't, the teachings don't penetrate to the mind of the students as deeply. So as we reveal this holy life as a teacher, we need to be sure that we're doing that with the right meaning and phrasing, ensuring that we have consistency over the entire talk and the entire teachings that we share. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? Let's go to Miranda. Yes, sir. Some of the things that are listed as challenges for householders, could they actually be more beneficial? Like which ones? Which ones are you thinking? Well, sir, like complacency. If you have to put forth more effort to overcome complacency as a householder, as opposed to an ordained practitioner who they have that rigid schedule, is that a bit more beneficial for a practitioner, sir? Yeah, one way that I think about the household life, and I've never been ordained, so I, I can only speak about the ordained life based on friends that I have that are ordained, students who have studied with me and shared things with me, things that I've observed. So I can't really speak about the ordained life so deeply. But I can say from the household life, I think that for someone to attain enlightenment in the household life, I feel that there's a lot more obstacles which means there's a lot more challenges and that means that requires a lot more wisdom in order to attain enlightenment in the household life. So I think that a household practitioner who attains enlightenment, who has a, a husband or a wife or children or things like this, that person is going to have much more wisdom about how they overcame the challenges of these relationships and the attachments that they had. 
and they're going to understand the wisdom of how to guide their children and how to interact with their life partner and how to have a career and how to have interactions in the community while still practicing these teachings where ordained practitioners tend to live a pretty secluded life in the temple or as they're doing certain things they're almost kind of removed from society to a certain extent therefore they're not navigating personal relationships like a life partner or children or a career or things like this so they will have guidance that they could offer to a household practitioner but i don't feel that their wisdom will be as deeply penetrating in this regard in terms of household life because they wouldn't have learned and practiced to attain enlightenment in the household life if they've attained enlightenment in the ordained path then they did it through that mechanism and they would have a lot of details and a lot of wisdom to help ordain practitioners to attain enlightenment but in terms of household life i feel just personally that my opinion is that they wouldn't maybe have as much wisdom of these things that we encounter in the household life as someone who is a household practitioner and has attained enlightenment. So to answer your question, uh, yes, Miranda, I agree with what you're sharing. And I share this as well, that I think that it just requires a lot more diligence, a lot more dedication, a lot more inner discipline, and therefore a lot more wisdom to overcome the obstacles in household life and actually attain enlightenment. And some people might actually choose to live the household life for a while they might go ordained for five or ten years and then they might come out and actually live more time in the household life so we understand that decisions that we make are not permanent so in this tradition there's not the expectation that once someone ordains that they are permanently ordaining in fact if somebody chose to unordain in some traditions of other teachings People look at that in a very demeaning way, in a very judgmental way, where here in terms of the way we look at Buddhist practitioners and ordaining, if someone ordained for five years or 10 years and chose to unordain, they're now coming in back into the community with a lot more wisdom that they had before they ordained. So this is kind of welcomed with open arms. People are left to make their own decisions of whether it's a lifetime ordination or not. And that can change moment to moment. But there's definitely a lot of wisdom that's needed no matter what to attain enlightenment in the ordained life or the household life. But there's certain topics of understanding that an ordained practitioner is going to have that household practitioners don't have. And there's going to be certain understanding that a household practitioner has that attains enlightenment that an ordained practitioner isn't going to necessarily have as part of their journey. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Well, no more question. All right. Well, let's move to chapter two. Yes. Uh, the next volunteer is Miranda. Let's go to her. Paying homage to the six directions. Well, venerable sir, how should one pay homage, respect to the six directions according to the noble discipline? It would be good if the perfectly enlightened one were to teach me the proper way to pay homage to the six directions according to the noble discipline. Young householder, it is by abandoning the four defilements of action, by not doing evil from the four causes, by not following the six ways of wasting one's substance, through avoiding these 14 evil ways that the noble disciple discovers the six directions, and by such practice becomes a conqueror of both worlds, so that all will go well with him in this world and the next, at the breaking up of the body after death. He will go to a good destination, a heavenly world, what are the four defilements of action that are abandoned? Taking life is one. Taking what is not given is one. Sexual misconduct is one. False speech is one. These are the four defilements of action that he abandons. What are the four causes of evil from which he refrains? Evil action springs up from craving. It springs from anger, ill will. It sp springs from ignorance, unknowing of true reality. It springs from fear. If the noble disciple does not act out of craving, anger, ignorance, or fear, he will not do evil from any one of the four causes. And which are the six ways of wasting one's substance that he does not follow? Addiction to strong drink and sloth producing drugs, substances that cause heedlessness, is one way of wasting one's substance. 
Haunting the streets at unfitting times is one. Attending fairs is one. Being addicted to gambling is one. Keeping unwholesome company is one. Habitual idleness is one. And how, householder son, does the noble disciple protect the six directions? These six things are to be regarded as the six directions. The east denotes mother and father. The south denotes teachers. The west denotes wife and children. The north denotes friends and companions. The nadir, down, denotes servants, workers, and helpers. The, the zenith, up, denotes ascetics and brahmins. Duties to minister the eastern direction. There are five ways in which a son should minister to his mother and father as the eastern direction. He should think, one, having been supported by them, I will support them. Two, I will perform their duties for them. Three, I will keep up the family tradition, craft or business. Four, I will be worthy of my heritage. Five, after my parents' deaths, I will distribute gifts on their behalf. And there are five ways in which the parents, so ministered to by their son as the eastern direction, will reciprocate. One, they will restrain him from evil. Two, support him in doing good. Three, teach him some skill. Four, find him a suitable wife, life partner. And five, in due time, hand over his inheritance to him. In this way, the eastern direction is covered, making it at peace and free from fear. Duties to minister to the southern direction. There are five ways in which pupils should minister to their teachers as the southern direction. One, by rising to greet them. Two, by waiting on them. Three, by being attentive. Four, by serving them. Five, by mastering the skills they teach. And there are five ways in which their teachers, thus ministered to by their pupils as the southern direction, will reciprocate. One, they will give thorough instruction. Two, make sure they have learned what they should have duly learned. Three, give them a thorough grounding in all skills. Four, recommend them to their friends and colleagues. And mm -hmm. five, provide them with security in all directions. In this way, the southern direction is covered, making it at peace and free from fear. Duty minister western direction. There are five ways to how husband should minister to his wife as the western direction. One, by honoring her. Two, by not disparaging her. Three, by not being unfaithful to her. Four, by giving authority to her. Five, by providing her with adornments. And there are five ways in which a wife, thus ministered to by her husband as the western direction, will reciprocate. One, by properly organizing her work. Two, by being kind to the servants. Three, by not being unfaithful. Four, by protecting stores. And five, by being skillful and diligent in all she has to do. In this way, the Western direction is covered, making it at peace and free from fear. Duties to minister to the Northern direction. There are five ways in which a man should minister to his friends and companions in the Northern direction. One, by gifts. Two, by kind words. Three, by looking after their welfare. Four, by treating them like himself. And five, by keeping his word. And there are five ways in which friends and companions thus ministered to by a man as the northern direction will reciprocate. One, by looking after him when he is inattentive. Two, by looking after his property when he is inattentive. Three, by being a refuge when he is afraid. Four, by not deserting him when he is in trouble. And five, by showing concern for his children. In this way, the northern direction is covered, making it at peace and free from fear. Duties to minister to the nadir direction. There are five ways in which a master should minister to his servants and work people as the nadir, down. One, by arranging their work according to their strength. Two, by supplying them with food and wages. Three, by looking after them when they are ill. Four, by sharing special delicacies with them. And five, by letting them off work at the right time. And there are five ways in which servants and work people thus ministered to by their master as the nadir will reciprocate. They will get up before him. Two, go to bed after him. Three, take only what they are given. Four, do their work properly. And five, be bearers of his praise and good repute. In this way, the nadir is covered, making it at peace and free from fear. Duties to minister to the zenith direction. There are five ways in which a man should minister to the ascetics and brahmins as the zenith, up. 
One, by kindness and bodily deed, actions. Two, by kindness and speech. Three, by kindness and thoughts, intentions. Four, by keeping open house for them. And five, by supplying their bodily needs. And the ascetics and Brahmins, thus ministered to by him as the Zena, will reciprocate in six ways. One, they will restrain him from evil. Two, encourage him to do good. Three, be kind-hearted and compassionate towards him. Four, teach him what he has not heard. Five, clarify what he has already heard. And six, point out to him the way to heaven. In this way, the Zenith is covered, making it at peace and free from fear. All right, thank you, Miranda. I would like to talk about a few things here now that we're entering into this book and we're starting to see certain teachings here. I share this in the preface of each one of the books, is that as you're learning the Buddhist teachings and you see the Buddha talking to a son about how to be a good son, or you see a husband being talked about how to be a good husband, you can flip these roles as well. It's how to be a good daughter, how to be a good wife, so forth and so on. So even though he might be talking to a man in this case, so he's using the pronoun of son and husband, these teachings are directly applicable to all genders and non-genders as well. So you'll see that in the preface of these books that I share that you can uh, look at that and apply the different genders depending on what role you are in society and what gender you feel that you are. The other thing that I would like to share specifically related to this teaching is that this is the Buddha on his way walking somewhere and there's this young boy who is essentially doing these Hindu rituals, these rites and rituals. And as he encounters this individual, he asks the Buddha, you know, how should I do this based on your teachings and the way that you teach? Because of course the Buddha didn't teach rites, rituals, ceremonies, and worship. So this boy you know, confronted with the Buddha walking through his area, said, you know, how would you do this same, you know, paying respect in the six directions based on your teachings? And that's what the Buddha is delivering here is a discourse or teachings of how to pay respect to all these different directions. And these six directions, essentially what the Buddha is describing is he's describing the natural law of gamma. He's saying that, okay, if you are a child and you have a mother and father and nowadays you know we have biological mothers and fathers we have adopted mothers and fathers we have grandmothers and grandfathers we have aunts and uncles we have all these people who play a significant role in our life and the buddha is saying okay the way that we should think in that role as a child that is being cared for is that having been supported by these people we should support them. You know, we should help them as they age. We're growing up. They've helped us to get to this point in our life. Now we should help them. And I will perform their their duties for them. You know, as parents and caregivers get older, the younger children can kind of step in and start helping around the house and start taking care of things. I will keep up the family tradition. In the lifetime of the Buddha, it was very common for a family of blacksmiths or farmers or a storekeeper or something to just keep with the same tradition because as you do it builds more and more gamma more and more success if people in your family continue that business then more and more people will know that you're in that particular business where nowadays we don't necessarily do that as much we tend to you know choose whatever career that we'd like to choose rather than having a family tradition And then there's other things here that the Buddha is talking about as well. I'm not going to go through each one, but you understand the first part is the Buddha basically saying, you know, if you do these things, what you're going to see in this particular case is the parents are then going to do these particular things. He's not telling you to do these things. He never gave you any rules or commandments. Instead, he's explaining the natural law of gamma that if a child does these things for their parents, then what they're going to observe is that these things are going to be done by their parents just naturally. It'll just happen. And he gives these different roles like a teacher. Like if you rise and greet your teacher, if you wait on them, if you're attentive to them, if you serve them, if you master the skills they teach, whether it's a teacher in Buddhism, but also a teacher, like I mentioned, like you're learning blacksmith or you're learning English or you're learning any kind of 
knowledge or wisdom nowadays, the Buddha is saying, okay, if you do these things with your teacher, then you're going to observe that your teacher is going to do these things naturally. This is part of the natural law of karma. So what questions do you guys have on any of these rather than go through each one individually? I'll just see what questions you guys have. Mm, not seeing any question for this one, teacher. Okay. As you read this chapter, you'll see some explanations that I share there. So you can also read that and let me know if there's any questions as you guys go forward. So chapter three. Yes, the next one teacher is Donnie. Let's go to him. Repeat one's mother and father. Monks, there are two persons that can easily be repaid to one's mother and father. Even if one should carry about one's mother on one shoulder and one's father on the other, and while doing so, should have a lifespan of a hundred years, live for a hundred years, and if one should attend to them by anointing them with arms, by massaging, bathing, and rubbing the limbs, and they even void the urine and excrement there, one still would not have done enough for one's parents nor would one have repaid them. Even if one were to establish one's parents as the supreme lords and rulers over this great earth, abounding in the seven treasures, one still would not have done enough for one's parents, nor would have one have repaid them. For what reason? Parents are of great help to their children. They bring them up, feed them, and show them the world. But monks, if when one's parents lack confidence, one encourages, settles, and establishes them in confidence. If, when one's parents are unwholesome, one encourages, settles, and establishes them in virtuous behavior or moral conduct. If, when one's parents are selfish, one encourages, settles, and establishes them in generosity. If, when one's parents are unwise, one encourages, settles, and establishes them in wisdom. In such a way, one can stand enough for one's parents, be paid them, and done more than enough for them. All right. Thank you, Donnie. This is a excerpt that you saw in Volume 1 if you were in the group learning program. This is something that we cover in Chapter 15 as part of True Love, that the Buddha is essentially saying here how important parents are, that they bring us up, they show us the world. They are the ones who essentially give us this start in life. And it's important that we look to take care of our parents because this human birth is the most ideal birth for us. This is where we're able to actually attain enlightenment. In the heavenly realm, we can attain enlightenment too, but it's not necessarily ideal because those beings are oftentimes complacent and usually lack the inner discipline to learn and practice to attain enlightenment. But here in this human realm, we experience all three feelings of pleasant feelings, painful feelings, and feelings that are neither painful nor pleasant. Therefore, we kind of have built-in motivation, where in the heavenly realm, they only experience exclusively pleasant feelings, and this is why they tend to be complacent. So here, the Buddha is kind of acknowledging that our mother and father are so important in our life that we should look to ensure that we care for them. And the Buddha gives this imagery of all these amazing things that we could do for our parents in terms of massaging them and anointing them with bombs and voiding their urine and excrement, you know, helping them to attain all these riches and all these different things in terms of seven treasures and establishing them as lords. But the Buddha is saying all of that, you know, we still wouldn't have repaid our parents enough because these are just kind of things that we're doing to take care of them. And yes, we should take care of them. But the real goal of every being in the human realm should be to attain enlightenment. And that's the real goal. That's what a Buddha is helping individuals to do. So the Buddha is saying, you know, when we observe that our parents are lacking and confidence in the Buddha, the teachings, and the community that we try to help them, encourage them, settle them, establish them in confidence where we're able to do that. And we need to find very humble ways to be able to do that because oftentimes our parents aren't necessarily interested in listening to their children. And the Buddha says that when we see that they're lacking moral conduct, that we can work to establish them in the moral conduct. When we observe that they're maybe selfish, we can work to maybe establish them in generosity. 
or we see that they lack wisdom, which is the ultimate goal of this path to enlightenment, is to attain wisdom. That's what antidotes that poison or that unwholesome root of ignorance is to practice wisdom. So these are four aspects of the mind or qualities of mind that the Buddha is saying we can encourage, settle, and establish our parents in. But with that, again, it needs to be done in a very humble way. And you also have to observe you know, how well it's being received. Some parents are very comfortable learning from their children and they are acknowledging of that and willing to do that. Other times it requires much more skillful approach in terms of the way that my wife and I have done this with our parents is typically we will have our parents sitting on a sofa or in a chair and we will sit on the floor and we will talk to them about all kinds of things. You know, we'll bring them some drink like water, some fruit juice. We'll make sure they're well fed. Maybe we've taken them out to a restaurant or something. And when we come back home, you know, we put them in a nice prominent space and we sit on the floor and we just kind of chit chat. And then as we see areas that we're able to share with them, we might kind of gradually start sharing some thoughts with them and see what their response is. If they're very adamantly against us, sharing in that particular moment, then we'll just move on to some other topic and we won't really continue to go down that path. But if they seem receptive and open and interested to learn, then we can continue to walk down that path. So these are things that you can consider. And the Buddha saying, you know, if you've done these things, then you can consider that you've done enough. And you need to know, you know, where's the right time? Because not only do you need to look at the right time, you have to speak truthfully, you have to speak gently, beneficially, and with a mind of loving kindness. And it's not where you want to just say, you know, mom, are you ready to start practicing Buddhism now? You know, you kind of gradually kind of move them towards that. You might even be interested to get them a book or something like this. But in some situations, your parents just aren't going to be interested in learning and practicing these teachings. And in that case, if they don't attain enlightenment in this life or at death, they're just going to need to experience more rebirths in order to get to the point where they're ready to do that in order to escape the whole cycle of rebirth and experience the elimination of discontentedness. And that's okay. We've all been reborn countless times. So if somebody's choosing in this life to not learn and practice these teachings, and that's also a decision to stay in discontentedness, that's a decision to stay in the cycle of rebirth, that's their decision. And you just have to let go and be unattached. Because if you have craving, anger, and ignorance, and you're trying to force your parents to learn and practice these teachings or improve their conduct, for example, this isn't going to go over well. So the Buddha is saying that we should look to establish our parents and encourage them in this direction. And what I'm sharing here with you is kind of how would you actually do that? What questions do you guys have on this chapter? Donnie has his hand raised there. Let's go to him. Um, actually, my question is about the previous chapter. Uh, there was one section where they were talking about uh, husbands, uh, how they should treat their wife, and they should give, uh, provide them with adornments. Man, man what's that? Yeah, this is like gifts. You know, like oh, the, the okay. way we the way we give each other flowers or perfume or chocolates. You know, things like this, things that kind of show our admiration or our adornment of the individual. And this is really helpful. This is a practice of generosity, of course, but it really helps to improve your relationship if you kind of regularly come home with a little something so that your partner realizes that you were thinking about them, whether it's in your day-to-day -day travels or you go out of town or you go out of country and you come back. Of course, your partner likes it when you they receive a gift from you because it helps them to understand that even when you are away, you were thinking about them. And sometimes we only do this around major holidays, but what the Buddha is teaching and guiding you to do is do that on a regular basis. You know, it doesn't have to be every day or even every week, but you know, definitely a couple of times a, a month, you know, when you're out getting yourself something to eat, get your partner something to eat. Or if you go into the store to get yourself a chocolate bar, get one for your partner too. You know, these little tiny things like this that can be really simple, really straightforward, really easy, and they can show your partner that you're really dedicated to the relationship and that you're looking to take care of them. And this will permeate in the relationship and really help to foster an improved relationship with your partner. 
I see. Oh, another one would be the very last part whereby um, the Brahmins will, I don't know, um, show them the way to heaven. Uh, does that literally mean the heavenly realm or the path to enlightenment? Yeah, so you haven't studied this with us yet, Dani, so it's great you're asking this question, that the goal of the Buddha was for everyone to attain enlightenment. If somebody's learning with him, it's to attain enlightenment. But the same teachings that are needed in order to get to enlightenment, if you fall short of enlightenment, they're also the same teachings that would help somebody be reborn into a heavenly realm. The goal isn't to be reborn in the heavenly realm, but there's beings that, you know, of course, need to go to the heavenly realm and maybe attain enlightenment from there. Others are reborn down into other realms out of the heavenly realm. So by the Buddha saying, you know, this is kind of the role of aesthetics and Brahman is point the way to heaven. It's also pointing the way to enlightenment as well, because oftentimes in the household life, it was kind of thought that, as the Buddha said, it's so dusty, it's so cluttered, it's so challenging, it was so difficult for household practitioners to attain enlightenment during the lifetime of the Buddha. They did attain enlightenment. There are household practitioners that attain enlightenment during the lifetime of the Buddha. But just short of that would be to get to the heavenly realm as like a non-returner, the third stage of enlightenment. So that's what he's explaining here. And particularly with Brahmin, you know, aesthetics, of course, should be sharing teachings to get to enlightenment. But Brahmin during the lifetime of the Buddha are these Brahmin priests who are practicing a tradition and their goal is to get to heaven. So that might be what the Buddha is also pointing out here, too, is being kind of all inclusive with the ordained practitioners and the Brahmin. But the ultimate goal should not be to get to heaven because you're still in the cycle of rebirth there. You're going to potentially be reborn countless more times, depending on how well someone does in the heavenly realm. It's best to put an end to all this discontentedness in this life, get to enlightenment and be done with it all. Thank you, teacher. You're welcome. Let's go to Miranda for Facebook questions. Yes, sir. On Facebook, Amina asks, can one repay their parents by simply forgiving them even when that parent has abandoned their child? Meaning, without contact, there is no way to repay them other than letting go of disappointment and loving that parent from the distance, which was choice by that parent. Yeah, so if you don't have contact with a parent, then you wouldn't be able to do these things. And that's the choice of the parent is that they're not having contact with you. So if that's what they've chosen, then you've done enough essentially you've probably at different times tried to have contact tried to have a relationship tried to show love and kindness and compassion and if that person isn't interested in a relationship or for one reason or another is choosing not to have a relationship then you've done enough what the buddha is teaching here is not to have craving and desire to keep pushing and pushing and pushing and try to force our parents to do these things but instead that where there's openness and there's a relationship that we can gradually, humbly help our parents to learn these things. But in certain situations, we're not gonna be able to do that. In terms of forgiving people, if you were to do this, this actually helps you. It doesn't necessarily help the other person. I mean, it can help the relationship, but if somebody's holding on to some resentment, you know, something in the mind, it's actually harming you. By you forgiving somebody for something, it's an enormous help to you. And yes, it will help the relationship, but there's absolutely no benefit to holding resentment or any kind of animosity towards anybody for anything. So I wouldn't say that by forgiving somebody, that's a way to repay them because you forgiving somebody is first of all, your own craving, desire, attachment. You chose to get angry. You chose to have this resentment. You chose to have this animosity. You're holding on to it. You letting go of it is actually helping you. It's not for the other person. It's actually to benefit you. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. No more questions here. All right. Let's move on to chapter four. Let's go to Jen. Three difficulties that separate mother and son. Monks, the uninstructed worldling speaks of these three difficulties that separate mother and son. What three? 
There comes a time when a great wildfire arises. When the great wildfire has arisen, it burns up villages, towns, and cities. When villages, towns, and cities are burning up, the mother does not find her son, and the son does not find his mother. This is the first difficulty that separates mother and son, of which the uninstructed worldling speaks. Again, there comes a time when a great rain cloud arises. When the great rain cloud has arisen, a great landslide takes place. When the great landslide takes place, villages, towns, and cities are swept away. When villages, towns, and cities are being swept away, the mother does not find her son, and the son does not find his mother. This is the second difficulty that separates mother and son, of which the uninstructed worldling speaks. Again, there comes a time of a dangerous windstorm in the wilderness, when the people of the countryside, mounted on their vehicles, flee on all sides. When there is a dangerous windstorm in the wilderness, and the people of the countryside, mounted on their vehicles, are fleeing on all sides, the mother does not find her son, and the son does not find his mother. This is the third difficulty that separates mother and son, of which the uninstructed worldling speaks. These are the three difficulties that separate mother and son, of which the uninstructed worldling speaks. There are amongst these three difficulties when mother and son reconnect that the uninstructed worldling speaks of as difficulties that separate mother and son. What three? There comes a time when a great wildfire arises, when a great rain cloud arises, and there comes a time of a dangerous windstorm in the wilderness. There is sometimes an occasion when the mother finds her son and the son finds his mother. There are three difficulties when mother and son reconnect that the uninstructed worldlings speak of as difficulties that separate mother and son. There are amongst these three difficulties that separate mother and son. What three? The difficulty of old age, the difficulty of illness, and the difficulty of death. When the son is growing old, the mother cannot fulfill her wish. Let me grow old, but may, may my son not grow old. And when the mother is growing old, the son cannot fulfill his wish. Let me grow old, but may my mother not grow old. When the son has fallen ill, the mother cannot fulfill her wish. Let me fall ill, but may my son not fall ill. And when the mother has fallen ill, the son cannot fulfill his wish. Let me fall ill, but may my mother not fall ill. When the son is dying, the mother cannot fulfill her wish. Let me die, but may my son not die. And when the mother is dying, the son cannot fulfill his wish. Let me die, but may my mother not die. These are the three difficulties that separate mother and son. There is a path, monks. There is a way that leads to the abandoning and overcoming of these three difficulties when mother and son reconnect, and of these three difficulties that separate mother and son. And what is the path and way? It is just this noble eightfold path that is right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. This is the path and way that leads to the abandoning and overcoming of these three difficulties when mother and son reconnect and of these three difficulties that separate mother and son. Thank you, Jan. So first, let's talk about what an uninstructed worldling is. A worldling is someone who's holding on to the world, the certain possessions, the existence in the world. This is a worldling. They have not yet overcome the holding on, the mental holding on. Uninstructed is someone who hasn't learned and practiced these teachings. An instructed noble disciple is a person who's deeply learning the teachings and is really close to the Buddha and close to enlightenment. That is an instructed noble disciple. But an uninstructed worldling is like somebody who's off the path or maybe, you know, just maybe beginning the path, but really off the path. And what the Buddha is describing here is the attachment between parent and child. Particularly, he's honing in on mother and son because mother and son tend to be very attached, just like father and daughter tend to be very attached. Doesn't mean that father can't be attached to son and mother can't be attached to daughter. It certainly is there. But these are tend to be 
even deeper, mother and son and father and daughter. And he talks about these, you know, great challenges of these different calamities in terms of weather, but he relates them to these other difficulties of old age, illness, and death, because these are very challenging for the human mind to understand and encounter and accept that as we grow old, we don't like that. Or if we see someone that we're attached to growing old, we don't like that. And that's where the Buddha is saying that the mother saying, you know, don't let my son grow old. And the son saying, oh, don't let my mother grow old because there's this attachment. And the same thing with illness and death. These are beings that are attached to each other and they're going to experience discontentedness as a result of that. So the Buddha is saying the way to eliminate all that and abandon that and overcome these difficulties of the mind longing and yearning for each other in relationships is the Eightfold Path. Through learning and practicing the Eightfold Path, you overcome that, you train the mind to let go, and now you won't experience those difficulties. You'll know that mom has to get old, mom has to get sick, mom has to die. This is the universal truth of impermanence. And if you have children, it's the same thing. They're going to have to get old. They're going to have illnesses and they're eventually going to die. And in some cases, our children die before parents. And if the parents aren't expecting that to occur, then oftentimes the mind is very shaken up. And sometimes relationships can even be ended as a result of a child that passes away prior to the parents. So these are all challenges that an uninstructed worldling is going to face, but learning and practicing the full path is what's going to overcome that so that then you can train the mind to be peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy, regardless of people getting old, of having illness or dying around you. Despite those things occurring, you can still remain peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. So this is the Buddha offering this understanding of how these relationships have attachment and it's going to lead to discontentedness but yet what he's sharing is training the mind how to overcome that questions on this yes teacher a uh, most likely this teaching wasn't uh, provided for ordained practitioners right it seems that it's uh, it was for a household practitioner is this a way to understand that Gautama buddha taught even householders, that there is a way to attain enlightenment. I mean, it's not just only for ordained, it's also for household practitioners. Yeah, this is something that I share with people is that, you know, as wise as the Buddha was, right, he had attained enlightenment on his own. He was truly a Buddha. Here we are 2,500 years later, still talking about his teachings, and they will be talked about for many centuries to come. If the Buddha was truly teaching that household practitioners couldn't attain enlightenment, which is what some people say in Buddhist communities, then why would this wise being even waste his time teaching household practitioners if they couldn't attain enlightenment? So he taught household practitioners because he knew that they could attain enlightenment. And oftentimes people would learn to a certain degree in the household life, and then they would ordain. And then there were people who would ordain and attain enlightenment, and then they would unordain. The Buddha is not attached to any one particular thing or one particular outcome, and he knows that household practitioners can attain enlightenment, and that's why he's teaching them. And he also knows that certain household practitioners are going to choose to ordain, and by them beginning their learning in the household life, that would help them in the ordained life as well. And he also knew that certain ordained practitioners who were ordained are going to choose to unordain at some point. The Buddha is not trying to hold on to these students in one way or another. A Buddha is just going to share teachings with anybody who has a sincere interest in learning and practicing the teachings. So this teaching that the Buddha is delivering is based on anybody who has a relationship. So even ordained practitioners have relationships with their mothers and fathers, even though they go into homelessness and they're no longer really have the same type of relationship where they might be talking regularly and caring for their mother and father, they still will have some amount of contact, some degree of contact. And it's important to also understand that as the Buddha taught, he wasn't just teaching by himself in you know, most situations, even if he was teaching to a household practitioner or to a certain village, there would have been ordained practitioners around listening to him 
describe these teachings. The reason why we have these teachings is because of what's called the first council or the first Buddhist council. That once the Buddha died, about three months after his death, a large group of enlightened beings, arahants, came together and started to discuss the teachings and you know how are we going to preserve these teachings for the future, for future generations. So these teachings that you're learning in the Pali Canon are directly from the ordained practitioners who had remembered his teachings all these years and came together shortly after his death in order to document them. One of his closest students was Ananda, who was his cousin and was with him for 45 years, pretty much from the very beginning all the way to the end at his death. And then ultimately Ananda attains enlightenment shortly after the death of the Buddha. Ananda is credited for sharing the vast majority of the teachings of the Buddha because he was with him so much and for such a long period of time that after the Buddha died, he was the one who was able to remember the most of the teachings. So these teachings would have been heard by ordained practitioners as well, even though he might have been teaching or even though he was teaching this to uh, household practitioners. Thanks, teacher. No more questions. All right. So now we'll move to the next chapter, which is chapter five. Four things wished for, desired, agreeable, and rarely gained in the world. Householder, there are these four things that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and rarely gained in the world. What for? One thinks, may wealth come to me righteously. This is the first thing in the world that is wished for, desired, agreeable, and rarely gained in the world. Having gained wealth righteously, one thinks, may fame come to me and to my relatives and preceptors. This is the second thing in the world that is wished for, desired, agreeable, rarely gained in the world. Having gained wealth righteously and having gained fame for oneself and for one's relatives and preceptors, one thinks, may I live long and enjoy a long lifespan. This is a third thing. Having gained wealth righteously, having gained fame for oneself and for one's relatives and preceptors, living long and enjoying a lifespan, a long lifespan. One thinks, with the breakup of the body after death, may I be reborn in a good destination in a heavenly world. This is the fourth thing. These are the four things that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and rarely gained in the world. There are, householder, four other things that lead to obtaining those four things. What for? Accomplishment in confidence, accomplishment in virtuous behavior, accomplishment in generosity, and accomplishment in wisdom. And what householder is accomplishment in confidence? Here, a noble disciple is endowed with confidence. He places confidence in the enlightenment of the Tathagata. Thus, the perfectly enlightened one is an arahant. Perfectly enlightened, accomplished in true wisdom and conduct, fortunate knower of the world, unsurpassed trainer of persons to be tamed, teacher of heavenly beings and humans, the enlightened one, the perfectly enlightened one. This is called accomplishment and confidence. And what is accomplishment in virtuous behavior? Here, a noble disciple abstains from the destruction of life, abstains from taking what is not given, abstains from sexual misconduct, abstains from false speech, abstains from liquor, wine, and intoxicants, substances that cause headlessness, the basis for headlessness. This is called accomplishment in virtuous behavior. And what is accomplishment in generosity? Here, a noble disciple resides at home with a mind free from the stain of selfishness, freely generous, open-handed, joyful in relinquishment, devoted to charity, joyful in giving and sharing. This is accomplishment in generosity. And what is accomplishment in wisdom? If one dwells with the mind overcome by longing and unrighteous sensual desires, one does what should be avoided and neglects one's duty so that one's fame and peacefulness are spoiled. If one dwells with a mind overcome by ill will, 
one does what should be avoided and neglects one's duty so that one's fame and peacefulness are spoiled. If one dwells with a mind overcome by complacency, if one dwells with a mind overcome by restlessness and worry, if one dwells with a mind overcome by doubt, when householder, a noble disciple has understood thus, longing and unrighteous sensual desires are a defilement of the mind. He, abstain, he abandons them. When he has understood thus, ill will is defilement of the mind. He abandons it. Complacency, restlessness, doubt. When householder, a noble disciple has understood thus, Longing and unrighteous sensual desire are a defilement of the mind and has abandoned them. When he has understood thus, ill will is a defilement of the mind and has abandoned it. Complacency, restlessness and worry, doubt. This is called accomplishment in wisdom. These are the four things that lead to obtaining the four things that are wished for, desired, agreeable and rarely gained in the world. All right. Thank you, Bossum. So here the Buddha is talking about things that people oftentimes essentially want or are wished for in the world. He gives us four things, which is wealth, fame, long life, and reborn in a good destination, the heavenly world. These are the four things that people really want. And this is actually going to Donnie's question that Donnie was asking too, is that, you know, this is something that people really want is all of these things. And then, you know, their, their mind might be longing or yearning or even craving these things. And the Buddha is saying, okay, or if somebody is really interested in obtaining those things, here's the way to do it, is the way to do that is to have confidence in the Buddha. Because if you have confidence in the Buddha, then you're going to learn and practice the teachings. And actually, it's going to help you to accomplish those four things that he talked about, which is wealth, fame, long life, and heavenly rebirth. Not that that's the goal, but that's what it would lead to, is that by learning and practicing these teachings, it would lead you in that direction. And then practicing virtuous behavior. And he talks about here, essentially, what are the five precepts. And he says, you know, this is how to have virtuous behavior. And then he talks about generosity because having generosity of giving and sharing, removing the stain of selfishness from the mind, this helps the mind to practice non-attachment and non-craving. By giving and sharing, the mind can then experience joyfulness. And then, of course, wisdom. And when he talks about wisdom here, he's talking about the elimination of the five hindrances, which we're going to be talking about tomorrow in the group learning program. Here, it's central desire, ill will, complacency, restlessness, and worry, and doubt. These are the five hindrances to enlightenment. And he's saying, you know, it, once you acquire the wisdom of how to overcome these things, this is going to help you, of course, on the path to enlightenment. And it's also going to help somebody to attain those other things that he mentioned. Not that we should have craving, desire, attachment for wealth, fame, a long life, or the heavenly realm. But if somebody's truly interested in obtaining those things, the Buddha is giving guidance of how to actually do that. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? Uh, no question. The same teacher. All right. So let's move to the next one. The next volunteer is Donnie. Chapter six. Donnie looks like he might have stepped away. So should I read this one? Uh, it's okay, teacher. Okay. Okay. So chapter six, nine things rooted in craving. I will teach you, monks, nine things rooted in craving. What are the nine things rooted in craving? In dependence on craving, there is seeking. In dependence on seeking, there is gain. In dependence on gain, there is judgment. In dependence on judgment, there is desire and lust. In dependence on desire and lust, there is attachment. In dependence on attachment, there is possessiveness. In dependence on possessiveness, there is selfishness. In dependence on selfishness, there is safeguarding. With safeguarding as a, the foundation, originate the taking up of rods in weapons, fights, contentions, and disputes, accusations, argumentative speech, and false speech, and many other evil, unwholesome things. 
These are the nine things rooted in craving. All right, so here the Buddha is a real expert at showing this cause and effect, this causality of how one thing leads to the next, leads to the next, leads to the next, leads to the next. He does this as part of the natural law of gamma. And when we studied dependent origination in volume five, you saw the ultimate truth of this causality and this cause and effect that leads to discontentedness and rebirth. Well, here is another cause and effect, cause and effect, cause and effect, where the Buddha is essentially giving us these nine things that are experienced in terms of, you know, safeguarding, taking up rods and weapons, fights, contentions, disputes, accusations, argumentative speech, false speech, and all these other unwholesome things. It's all rooted in craving. As you guys know from learning that one of the major goals on this path is to eliminate craving, desire, attachment, because it's the cause of discontentedness. It's also the cause of rebirth. And here the Buddha is giving you all these other things that it causes as well. And he shows you the step-by-step -step process of how craving leads to these evil, unwholesome things. Any questions here? No question, the same teacher. Okay. And one thing I will add is, you know, when you eliminate craving, you eliminate discontentedness and rebirth. And then you also eliminate these other things that the Buddha is talking about here. The fights, contentions, disputes, accusations, argumentative speech, and so forth and so on. So eliminating craving brings so many benefits to your life and to the mind. All right. Chapter seven. Let's go to Miranda. Indebtedness is discontentedness in the world. Monks, isn't poverty discontentedness in the world for one who enjoys sensual pleasures? If a poor, impoverished, needy person gets into debt, isn't his indebtedness too discontentedness in the world for one who enjoys sensual pleasures? If a poor, impoverished, needy person who has gotten into debt promises to pay interest, isn't the interest too discontentedness in the world for one who enjoys sensual pleasures? If a poor, impoverished, needy person who has promised to pay interest cannot pay it when it falls due, they admonish him. Isn't being admonished to discontentedness in the world for one who enjoys sensual pleasures? If a poor, impoverished, needy person who is admonished does not pay, they prosecute him. Isn't prosecution to discontentedness in the world for one who enjoys sensual pleasures? If a poor, impoverished, needy person who is prosecuted does not pay, they imprison him. Isn't imprisonment to discontentedness in the world for one who enjoys sensual pleasures? So, monks, for one who enjoys sensual pleasures, poverty is discontentedness in the world. Getting into debt is discontentedness in the world. Having to pay interest is discontentedness in the world. Being admonished is discontentedness in the world. Prosecution is discontentedness in the world and imprisonment is discontentedness in the world. So too, monks, when one does not have confidence in cultivating wholesome qualities, when one does not have a sense of moral wrongdoing in cultivating wholesome qualities, when one does not have moral concern in cultivating wholesome qualities, when one does not have energy in cultivating wholesome qualities, when one does not have wisdom in cultivating wholesome qualities, in the noble one's discipline, one is called a poor, impoverished, needy person. Having no confidence, no sense of moral wrongdoing, no moral concern, no energy, no wisdom in cultivating wholesome qualities, that poor, impoverished, needy person engages in misconduct by body, speech, and mind. This, I say, is his getting into debt. To conceal his bodily, verbal, and mental misconduct, he nurtures an evil, unwholesome desire. He wishes, let no one know me. He intends with the aim, let no one know me. He speaks statements with the aim, let no one know me. He makes bodily actions with the aim, let no one know me. This, I say, is the interest he must pay. Well-behaved fellow monks speak thus about him. This venerable one acts in such a way, behaves in such a way. This, I say, as his being admonished. When he has gone to the forest, to the foot of a tree, or to an empty dwelling, Evil, unwholesome thoughts accompanied by remorse attack him. This, I say, is his prosecution. Then, with the breakup of the body after death, that poor, impoverished, needy person who is engaged in misconduct by body, speech, and mind is bound in the prison of hell or the prison of the animal realm. 
I do not see, monks, any other prison that is as terrible and harsh and such an obstacle to attaining the unsurpassed security from bondage, enlightenment, as the prison of hell or the prison of the animal realm. Poverty is called discontentedness in the world. So too is getting into debt. A poor person who becomes indebted is troubled while enjoying himself. Then they prosecute him, and he also incurs imprisonment. This imprisonment is indeed discontentedness for one yearning to gain sensual pleasures. Just so in the noble one's discipline, one in whom confidence is lacking, who does not see danger in wrongdoing and rue, heaps up a mass of evil, unwholesome calm. Having engaged in misconduct by body, speech, and mind, he forms the wish, may no one find out about me. He twists around with his body, twists around by speech or mind, he piles up his evil, unwholesome deeds in one way or another, repeatedly. This unwise evildoer, knowing his own misdeeds, a poor person who falls into debt, troubled while enjoying himself. His thoughts then prosecute him. Painful mental states born out of remorse follow him wherever he goes, whether in the village or the forest. This unwise evildoer, knowing his own misdeeds, goes, goes to a certain animal realm or is even bound in hell. This indeed is the discontentedness of bondage from which the wise person is free, giving gifts with wealth righteously gained, settling his mind with confidence. Thank you, Miranda. There's a lot here in this teaching that you can digest and understand. This first part, kind of this first page, is the Buddha talking about how getting into debt creates discontentedness. If you've ever been in a massive amount of debt or if you're currently in a massive amount of debt, there's a lot of stress and a lot of anxiety associated with that. If you're able to get yourself out of debt, you really create some more liberation because as long as you're in debt, you owe somebody money, you're going to be working and working and working feverishly. And if you don't do that, then there's a lot of penalties that can come about. The Buddha is talking about imprisonment here. So those kind of things can happen. So by you getting out of debt and living debt free and using cash in order to pay things that you need to take care of, this can be really liberating from the mind. Because oftentimes one of the reasons why we get into debt is because of our craving desire attachment. Not all the time, but oftentimes it can be from our own craving desire attachment that that's where the Buddha talks about down here, that someone who is essentially in poverty, they are troubled while enjoying themselves. If we are in poverty because of generational poverty, or if we go into debt because perhaps we've had a sick family member and we're trying to help them, you know, these things happen sometimes. But oftentimes we get into debt just because we aren't interested in waiting a month or two to purchase something with cash. We want it right now because we're chasing those pleasant feelings. And then those pleasant feelings wear off and we want something else right now. And we buy things on credit, on credit, on credit, and we stack up all this debt. And this is somebody who's troubled while enjoying themselves. They're enjoying themselves with all these new gifts, all these new things that they've purchased for themselves, but yet they're in debt and they're actually being troubled and you know it just hasn't necessarily caught up with them yet. So by letting all of that go and getting yourself out of debt, you can function with a more liberated mind where you don't have to you know, be tied down to a particular creditor or something like this. And the Buddha talks down here where he's talking about, you know, someone who's doing this and they're kind of twisting around. They're maybe lying about their bodily actions, their speech. They're kind of trying to hide the things that they're doing. This person is unwise. The Buddha is calling them an unwise evildoer. Knowing his misdeeds essentially gets reborn into the lower realm of the animal realm or the hell realm. And the Buddha is saying that, you know, this is like a prison. Once somebody's reborn into the animal realm or the hell realm, this is very much like a prison. But instead, what a wise person is going to do is a wise person is going to work to get free from this debt and not live based on craving, desire, attachment. A wise person is going to have trained the mind to not go in debt based on these craving, desire, attachments. But instead, a wise person who doesn't have craving, they actually, you'll find that without craving, 
it doesn't require a whole lot of money to exist in the world that you can actually uh, save a lot of money by not having craving. It's very expensive to maintain craving, desire, attachment. If you have to have the latest phone when it comes out, it's very expensive. If you have to have the, a new car every two years, every three years, if you have to constantly upgrade to a bigger and bigger house or nicer and nicer clothing, this is just craving, desire, attachment, and it's going to lead to problems in one's life. But when you restrain the mind and you pull back from that craving, desire, attachment, the Buddha is talking here about someone is actually freed from that craving, desire, attachment, that they actually gain wealth, and then they can actually give gifts that you can turn this around rather than just going into debt based on our own selfish desires and taking on all this stress and anxiety. Instead, we can come out of that debt. We can, by reducing our craving and eliminating our craving, and then we can actually develop wealth and actually give gifts to others. And this is where you'll see that your life will really improve because now you're treating others around you in very wonderful ways. And as you give gifts to others, they're going to be more than interested in helping you because it's your gamma. You shouldn't give gifts because you want something from someone or you expect something from someone. But what you'll see is the more generous that you are to the people around you, you're going to have plenty of people that are willing to help you when you need help because you're being so generous in your actions and practicing generosity. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? Well, uh, are you saying here or... Does Gautama Buddha is saying here that uh, the more, the simpler life, the more simple life one has, and uh, without getting into debts, the, it's a kind of putting down the burden? Yeah, so the burden that the Buddha talks about is craving, desire, attachment. That's carrying a burden. And it's a real burden to carry around craving, desire, attachment because it's going to lead to discontent feelings. But also, if you have craving for pleasant feelings and you're spending money in order to try to obtain those pleasant feelings, then yeah, that's a part of the burden that you're carrying around. And by letting down or setting down the craving, desire, attachment, by setting down the burden, then you won't go into debt. You can just live like you're talking, uh, Basim, a very simple, very basic life, not this luxurious lifestyle that you can't afford, but live within your means. You'll see other parts of the Buddhist teachings where he talks about in this book that a household practitioner should ensure that their income is greater than their expenses. And when you have it the other way around, when your expenses are greater than your income, this is where you're kind of upside down and you're going deeper and deeper into debt, which means you're going deeper and deeper into discontentedness because you're going to have stress and anxiety related to that. So in all situations, you should try to manage your expenses so that your expenses are lower than your income. In that way, there's always a cash positive and you can be saving money or you can be using it for generosity and helping other people. Where if you're in debt now, the best thing you can do is gradually work towards getting out of debt. And then ultimately, once you get out of debt, be sure you maintain that. And all you really need to do in order to get out of debt is restrain your craving, come back and reduce your expenses. And then where you can try to increase your income. And there, when you have positive cash flow, you can pay down your debt, get out of debt. And then once you're out of debt, then you've got this positive cash flow that you can now start building wealth and also practicing generosity more frequently. Thanks, Sir. Jen has the hand raised. Let's go to her. Thank you, Basim. Um, teacher David, this is a, on page 44, there's something I have a question about. It says, when one, it, it refers to energy, right? Um, when one does not have energy in cultivating wholesome qualities. So I've seen this mentioned in other places too, where the Buddha speaks about energy, ex exerting energy to develop your wholesome qualities. I, but I find that I don't understand that very well. Sure. This relates to the seven factors of enlightenment. And the enlightenment factor of energy is all about enthusiasm and motivation, kind of a willingness to do something. So when one does not have a motivation or enthusiasm or willingness to cultivate wholesome qualities, 
that's what he's talking about right here. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm, you're welcome. No more question, teacher. All right. Let's go to the next chapter, which should be chapter eight. So let's go to Jen. Thank you, Basim. Welfare and peacefulness in this present life. Venerable sir, we are householders enjoying sensual pleasures, living at home in a house full of children. We use sandalwood from Kasi. We wear garlands, scents, and ointments. We receive gold and silver. Let the perfectly enlightened one teach us the teachings in a way that will lead to our welfare and peacefulness in this present life and in future lives. There are, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce this. These four things that lead to the welfare and peacefulness of a householder in this present life. What for? Accomplishment and initiative, accomplishment and protection, wholesome friendship and balanced living. Accomplishment in initiative. And what is accomplishment in initiative? Here, whatever may be the means by which a householder earns his living, whether by farming, trade, raising cattle, archery, government service, or some other craft, he is skillful and diligent. He possesses sound and wise decision-making about it in order to carry out and arrange it properly. This is called accomplishment in initiative. Accomplishment in protection. And what is accomplishment in protection? Here, a householder sets up protection and guard over the wealth he has acquired by initiative and energy amassed by the strength of his arms, earned by the sweat of his brow, righteous wealth, righteously gained, thinking, how can I prevent kings and thieves from taking it, fire from burning it, floods from sweeping it off, and displeasing heirs from taking it? This is called accomplishment in protection. Wholesome friendship. And what is wholesome friendship? Here, in whatever village or town a householder lives, he associates with householders or their sons, whether young or mature virtue, or old and of mature virtue, who are accomplished in confidence, virtuous behavior, moral conduct, generosity, and wisdom. He converses with them and engages in discussions with them. To the extent that they are accomplished in confidence, he emulates them with respect to their accomplishment in confidence. To the extent that they are accomplished in virtuous behavior, moral conduct, he emulates them with respect to their accomplishment in virtuous behavior. To the extent that they are accomplished in generosity, he emulates them. To the extent that they are accomplished in wisdom, he emulates them. This is called wholesome friendship balanced living. And what is balanced living? Here, a householder knows his income and expenditures and leads a balanced life, neither too extravagant nor too frugal, aware. In this way, my income will exceed my expenditures rather than the reverse. Just as an appraiser or his apprentice holding up a scale knows, by so much it is dipped down, by so much it has gone up, so a householder knows his income and expenditures and leads a balanced life, neither too extravagant nor too frugal, aware. In this way, my income will exceed my expenditures rather than the reverse. If this householder has a small income but lives luxuriously, others would say of him, this householder eats his wealth just like an eater of figs. But if he has a large income, but lives sparingly, others would say of him, this householder may even starve himself. But it is called balanced living when a householder knows his income and expenditures and leads a balanced life, neither too extravagant nor too frugal, aware. In this way, my income will exceed my expenditures rather than the reverse. This is called balanced living. These are the four things that lead to the welfare and peacefulness of a householder in this very life. Great, thank you, Jan. So here the Buddha is giving guidance of four things that can lead to peacefulness in this life. And he talks about initiative, protection, wholesome friendships, and balanced living. And he gives guidance on each of these. So you can read this and see that the Buddha taught very clearly. You know, Buddha is not trying to be tricky. You know, Buddhist teachings aren't just 
you know, these little catchphrases and things like this, these little memes that we see floating around in social media. He's explaining, you know, the natural law of gamma. He's explaining how to live a good, wholesome life. And then whether someone chooses to learn, reflect and practice that is up to them. But when you learn the Buddhist teachings and you reflect on them and you practice them, they just make so much sense that he explains it so clear and so eloquently, but also so very concise and precise that he's explaining these four things that will help you to get to peacefulness. This isn't the only four, but these are four. And he explains them very clearly. Some ones that I would like to kind of focus in on in this one about wholesome friendships. He talks about this at different times in his teachings and explains the importance of wholesome friendships right here. He talks in other parts about how it's important to cultivate wholesome friendships, but here he talks about kind of the why, that when you have someone who is practicing in wholesome ways and then you emulate their conduct, their confidence, their virtuous behavior, their generosity and their wisdom. Whereas if you had people around you who are into unwholesome things, your mind's gonna have a tendency to be influenced by that and lean towards that. So by you ensuring that you have wholesome friends around you, even if it's just one or two or three, it's better to have a very limited number of friends than to have a whole bunch of people that are into unwholesome things because your mind is gonna to lean towards that and you're gonna have some troubles by doing that. So here the Buddha is explaining to you that it will help you to practice these qualities that are important for your enlightenment by cultivating friendships that are of that same nature. And then we also talk in today's times about living a balanced lifestyle, but everybody has kind of a different definition of what that means is what does it mean to live a balanced lifestyle? Well, here the Buddha is actually explaining that this was a topic that was around during his lifetime too. It's not just a new topic that we've been talking about in modern times. That here he's talking about the income and expenditures, like what I was explaining earlier, that a person should ensure that their income is more than their expenditures. If you have it the other way around, you're going to have a lot of challenges. But also he talks here that if you have a lot of income and very little expenditures and you are very frugal, almost too frugal with your money, that this is like kind of starving yourself and kind of starving the people around you. If you're just working to kind of stack up a bank account and you really like to see your bank account grow, but yet you're not spending time to enjoy some of the things in life and kind of finding this middle way, then the person is going to really struggle because the Buddha talks about it here is starving yourself. So if you have craving to just watch your bank account grow because the ego feels good when it sees that, but also if you're upside down in your expenses where your expenses are higher than your income, both of these things are going to lead to discontentedness. It's only when you find this middle way where you have an income higher than your expenditures and then you choose to do some things occasionally that are going to be enjoyable for you and your family and the people around you. There's no reason to just allow money to stack up in the bank account. You know, how much money does somebody really need in a bank account? This really kind of bolsters the ego the more and more and more the money goes up in the bank account. So you can live a really good life and kind of find that middle for yourself. And everybody has to find that middle and know where that middle is. You know, if you have young children that you're preparing for college, maybe you need to save some money. Whereas if you're a little bit older or you don't have children, maybe your expenditures are down. These things are all impermanent and you need to balance your living so that your cravings aren't putting you into debt and exhausting your income, but also your cravings aren't just stacking up money in your bank account where you never do anything to enjoy yourself either. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? It's a good one, Radha. Yes, sir. This question goes back a little bit to getting into debt also. For something like student loans, should that be viewed more as wisely investing money because you're investing in your education to have a more profitable career? Or is this something that we should strive not to get into debt that way also? You know, for some people, it's possible to go to college without getting into debt. For others, you know, they need to take on some debt in order to go to college. And it's not that you should never have any debt. It's about making wise choices. So if somebody's 
going to college and getting a loan and their intention is to go to school, go to university, study really diligently and get out and repay their loan, then okay, this is great. You know, this is what I might call good debt because it's leading towards some beneficial result. But sometimes what we see is people take student loans, they go to college, they party, they're in the party atmosphere, and they actually don't complete college or they don't take it as seriously so that when they do graduate, they don't necessarily have the skills that they need to have upward trajectory in their career, and therefore they're stuck and they're not able to pay back the loan as intended. So if we're gonna take debt, something like a student loan, which I might call good debt, then we should ensure that we're using that money for what it's intended for, which is the education, do a really good job while we're there, being very diligent and dedicated to our education. And then when we leave out of college, be sure that we're working towards improving our career and repaying that debt because that debt is what allowed us to gain those skills. And now we can use those skills to improve our life and ultimately pay off the debt. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Let's go to Jen. Thank you, boss. And thank you, teacher David. Um, I have, a, I feel uh, that I should save enough money so that I won't be a burden on my child when I'm old. And mm -hmm. so I wonder if you have any guidance about that. Yeah, these are all things that different cultures do different ways. You know, here in Thailand, they don't have 401k programs or IRAs or things like that. Essentially, what you do as a parent is you take really good care of your children. And then as your children uh, grow up, they start making money and then they take care of the parents because the parents don't have money to put away in a 401k or an IRA or things like this. But other cultures, mainly Western cultures, it's up to each individual to kind of save money for themselves so that they can then take care of themselves. And this is the way the culture is. So there's different cultures that do things different ways. And if that's the way that you'd like to live, that's the way your culture is, that's what your children are thinking that is appropriate, then it would only make sense to, you know, ensure that you're saving money for as you age, because you know that, you know, when you're early in life, you know, your earning potential is very low. And then you kind of build up your skills and you have this middle period of your life where you have really high earning potential. And then as we age, you know, sometimes our earning potential goes down a bit. So we need to kind of be saving all the way through. When I was first graduated from college and I got my first job, I started saving in a 401k uh, right away from pretty much the very beginning of my career at the age of like 22 or 23. And then all the way through, I just always kind of saved a little bit of money. But you can do this in a balanced way. Sometimes the mind wants to do all or nothing. So at the same time that I was saving money in a 401k, I was also, you know, having living expenses and things like that. But I was also sharing with family and friends and making donations and charitable things as well. So it's important to have this balanced living where you're able to do all these things, where it's not just all savings, it's not just all living expenses, and it's not just all giving to others as well, but you kind of balance your wealth across all of these things and make sure all of these things are satisfied. And if you're building up to retirement, then that's something that it sounds like you're gonna to need to save for and that you probably have been saving for. Thanks, Steve. No more questions. All right. We'll go to chapter nine. Hey, the next volunteer is Miranda. Four sources of depletion and accumulation of the wealth. The four sources of depletion of the wealth. Vaya Padja, the wealth thus amassed has four sources of depletion. One, womanizing. Two, drunkenness, heedlessness. Three, gambling. Four, unwholesome friendship unwholesome companionship, unwholesome comradeship. Student, just as if there were a large reservoir with four inlets and four outlets, and a man would close the inlets and open the outlets, and sufficient rain does not fall, one could predict the water in the reservoir to decrease rather than increase. Student, so the wealth thus amassed has four sources of depletion. One, womanizing. Two, drunkenness, heedlessness. Three, gambling. Or unwholesome friendship, unwholesome companionship, unwholesome comradeship. 
the four sources of accumulation of the wealth. Student, the wealth thus amassed has four sources of accumulation. One, one avoids womanizing. Two, one avoids drunkenness, heedlessness. Three, one avoids gambling. Four, one cultivates wholesome friendship, wholesome companionship, wholesome comradeship. Student, just as if there were a large reservoir with four inlets and four outlets, and a man would open the inlets and close the outlets, and sufficient rain falls, one could predict the water in the reservoir to increase rather than decrease. Student, so the wealth thus amassed has four sources of accumulation. One, one avoids womanizing. Two, one avoids drunkenness or heedlessness. Three, one avoids gambling. Four, one cultivates wholesome friendship wholesome companionship, wholesome comradeship. These are the four things that lead to the welfare and peacefulness of a householder in this very life. All right. Thank you, Miranda. Here, the Buddha is giving us some guidance of how wealth gets depleted and how wealth gets accumulated. And if you've done any of these things, then you know the truth, that the Buddha is speaking 100% the truth. This womanizing, you know, again, he's speaking to men, so he's saying womanizing. But essentially what he's talking about here is kind of running around town, you know, with the interest of, you know, essentially uh, taking advantage of people or having sexual casual relationships or essentially having unchastity, which he talks about in the five precepts. That's what womanizing is or, uh, you know, kind of running around town. And that's going to cost a lot of money to have lots of different partners in your life. If you have two, three, four, five different partners, this is going to be very expensive, just like drunkenness or taking substances that cause heedlessness, gambling, and having unwholesome friends, unwholesome companions, and unwholesome comrades. Because as your friends are into unwholesome things, you're going to also get into unwholesome things. And you guys are going to need to use money in order to get out of these problems. You're going to have to pay lawyers and court costs and all different kinds of problems you might have with injuries to the body or injuries to cars and things like this. So it's going to cost a lot of money to do these things. So therefore, money is going to be depleted. Your wealth is going to be depleted. But by eliminating these as part of what you do on a day-to-day basis, then the Buddha is saying this is what accumulates wealth. By not doing these things, it will help you to accumulate more wealth because your money won't be flowing out like water. Any questions on this chapter? No question, the same teacher. All right. I'll go to the last chapter for today. And there's a lot to read here for, with each one of these chapters from the explanations. You can read those and get some more details. So here's number 10. Four things leading to the welfare and peacefulness in future lives. The, there are, a student, these four other things that lead to a householder's welfare and peacefulness in future lives. What for? One, accomplishment in confidence. Two, accomplishment in virtuous behavior. Three, accomplishment in generosity. And four, accomplishment in wisdom. And what is accomplishment in confidence? Here, a householder is endowed with confidence. He places confidence in the enlightenment of the Tathagata. Thus, the perfectly enlightened one is an Arahant, perfectly enlightened, accomplished in true wisdom and conduct, fortunate, knower of the world, unsurpassed leader of persons to be tamed, teacher of heavenly beings and humans, and fortunate one, the perfectly enlightened one. This is called accomplishment and confidence. And what is accomplishment in virtuous behavior, moral conduct? Here a householder abstains from the destruction of life, from taking what is not given, from sexual misconduct, from false speech, and from liquor, wine, and intoxicants substances that cause head, that cause headlessness the basis for headlessness this is called accomplishment in virtuous behavior and what is accomplishment in generosity here the householder resides at home with a mind free of the stain of selfishness freely generous open-handed joyful in letting go one devoted to charity joyful in giving and sharing this is called accomplishment in generosity and what is accomplishment in wisdom? Here, a householder is wise. He possesses the wisdom that discerns arising and passing away, which is noble and penetrative and leads to the complete destruction of discontentedness. This is called accomplishment in wisdom. 
These are the four other things that lead to the welfare and peacefulness of a householder in future lives. All right. Thank you, Balsam. So here the Buddha is giving us these four things again, which we studied in a previous chapter here that lead to beneficial results in this life, this you know peaceful life and also in, in future lives as well. That having the confidence in the Buddha, of course, you're going to have that confidence, learn the teachings, practice as being part of a community. You're going to move the mind closer and closer to enlightenment and experience the results of that. This is the beauty of Gautama Buddha's teachings is there's no belief here, but instead you're learning, reflecting and practicing and seeing the discontentedness gradually diminish over time, knowing that you're improving the condition of the mind, know that you're on the right path in terms of the path to enlightenment. There's no belief there. And as you do that, you're improving your moral conduct and practicing virtuous behavior. And practicing generosity is so very important. You're going to see this come up in multiple places of the Buddhist teachings where he teaches generosity. And there's an entire book in the series devoted to generosity because it's so important. And the reason why it's so important is because it's an antidote to the primary problem that's causing the discontentedness, which is craving, desire, attachment. That's the cause of discontentedness. That's the cause of the cycle of rebirth in terms of why a being is reborn and all these other problems that are experienced in, in the mind, like we were talking about in this class, in terms of going into debt, in terms of arguments, in terms of fights and all these different things that happen. So the reason why generosity is so important is because it's so beneficial to the mind to train the mind to eliminate craving, desire, attachment. Eliminating craving, desire, attachment will lead to the elimination of discontentedness, lead to the elimination of rebirth, and lead to all these other benefits that the Buddha talks about. Here, when he chooses to talk about accomplishment and wisdom, he talks about someone who possesses wisdom that discerns the arising and passing away. Here, what he's talking about is the universal truth of impermanence. That if you have the wisdom to see the arising and the fading away of something or the passing away of something, then you understand the universal truth of impermanence. And having penetrated that wisdom, the Buddha is saying that's what leads to the destruction of discontentedness. Because the, what causes discontentedness is the craving, desire, attachment, wanting things to be permanent. And the mind's craving and clinging, holding on to these things thinking that these things are permanent. And then when impermanence happens, that's where the mind becomes discontent. So if somebody understands or discerns the arising and passing away, they understand the universal truth of impermanence. They penetrate this wisdom and that leads to the complete destruction of discontentedness. And that's what's going to lead to welfare and peacefulness for a household practitioner in future lives. But it's also going to lead to this welfare and peacefulness in this life as well, not just future lives, but in this life, that you can actually start learning the universal truth of impermanence, which is the very first teaching that I always share with someone who is interested to get on this path, because without an understanding in that, you're not going to understand something like the Four Noble Truths, which means you're not going to understand the Eightfold Path. So establishing right view and understanding the universal truth of impermanence is vitally important to anybody who's interested in attaining enlightenment. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? Uh, no question for this one, teacher, but uh, we have uh, a question on YouTube from Susan. Uh, it seems that it's a comment not a question. Dear teacher, most people in the world seem to be lost with no morals. Their solution to suffering is running away from self and entertainment, avoiding real problem. I know no one in my life who understands. Yes, what you're seeing is you're seeing the enormous amount of discontentedness in the world. The Buddha emerged from meditation at one point in his life and he proclaimed that the world is burning. Right. So the more you learn these teachings, the more you understand these teachings, the more you just see discontentedness and suffering everywhere. And when you understand that it's self-imposed, you have a lot of loving kindness and compassion for these beings, because the more awakened your mind becomes, the more you're going to see how much people are really suffering in the world. And this is where you need to train the mind to let go, because 
the more you hold on to the world and everyone else is suffering, then you're not going to be able to get to liberation. So you have to let go of the world, realizing that, yeah, other people aren't aware. They don't have the wisdom. They're deeply in craving anger and ignorance. But for you, if you're interested in getting to enlightenment, let go of all of that. Move to enlightenment, continue to move towards that. And as you do, then your mind won't be shaken up when you see all this discontentedness and suffering in the world. And then if somebody is truly interested in receiving help or having understanding or guidance, as an enlightened being, you'll be much more capable of doing that. Whereas if you stay in the discontentedness, you're not going to be able to help others. The way that I think about this is that if somebody was in quicksand and they were sinking in quicksand, what would you do? Would you jump down in the quicksand and try to help them out? No, you wouldn't. You would stand on stable ground. You would reach out your hand and they would have to grab onto your hand and they're going to have to do some kicking in order to get out of that quicksand as you pull them, right? You can't do all the work. You can't literally pull someone out of quicksand, they have to do some work themselves. The first thing they have to do is grab onto your hand and your arm. Then the second thing is they have to start doing some kicking. So if someone's not willing to grab onto your hand, then you can't help them. They're going to sink in the quicksand. So this is why a teacher of these teachings, we share these teachings, we set it up so that people can come and learn open to all beings to come and learn openly and freely but a being needs to decide to step forward in order to learn because there's a million and one decisions that somebody has to make in order to get to enlightenment. And they have to have the motivation to do that themselves. So you're going to see the more you understand these teachings, the more you're going to see the world is burning as the Buddha described it. It's these three fires, craving, anger, and ignorance. It's everywhere around you, but you can ascend You can ascend from that. So if you think about that lotus flower in the pond, the murky water, it has to ascend through this murky water and rise above the murky water and then bloom. And you're rising above the murkiness of this world. And then once you do, you'll be so pleased that you did, that you didn't hold on to what's going on in the world, but instead you ascended above it and became liberated from it. And then everything can be peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. Thanks, teacher. That's all for today. All right. So our next class on Saturday for our Poly Canon English study group, we're going to be studying chapters 11 through 20. So feel free to read those this week. Read the words of the Buddha and the explanations that I provide. If you don't have this book yet, you can go to buddhadailywisdom.com and click on free books. From there, you'll see the link that you can download it for free. You can take it and go print it. You can order a printed version or a Kindle version. Whatever works for you, you can acquire a version of this book and all the other books. And if you read prior to class, that's great because then you are prepared to talk about and ask questions and have discussion. But you can also read after class as well. Some people learn both ways. Some people like to read before. Some people like to read after. Some people read before and after class. But if you're not doing that reading, you're not going to get the level of depth that is really being offered to you because in these classes, I don't teach nearly to the level of depth that I provide in these books. In these books, I'm able to sit down. I was able to, you know, write out exactly what I was interested in sharing with you in terms of teachings. So there you're going to see all the details. So be sure you're reading the words of the Buddha as well as the explanations to help you along and then seek guidance as you need help by either posting in Facebook by asking questions in class, by sending a private message, or by scheduling a personal guidance session. Tomorrow in the group learning program, we're going to be studying the five hindrances. These are the obstacles or the roadblocks, the hindrances to your attainment of enlightenment. We mentioned those in today's class, but what I'm going to be doing in tomorrow's class is I'm going to be explaining what they are in detail And I'm going to be explaining the antidotes or the remedies or the solutions to them because you're most likely going to experience these or are experiencing them right now. 
And you're going to need to know what's the solution. How do I get out of these hindrances? Because you need to overcome these obstacles in order to get to enlightenment. That's what we're going to be discussing in tomorrow's group learning program. And then on Wednesday, we're going to be doing loving kindness meditation together. That's going to be our very last meditation as part of that iteration of the group learning program. And then we're going to be restarting the whole program again on the 6th of April. On the 3rd of April, which is next Sunday, we're going to be doing a special class where I'm going to open up and just let all of you guys ask me any questions that you would like about my life or the path or what that I find most challenging about the path. What are my goals from this point forward or anything like that? You guys are welcome to ask any and all questions on the 3rd of April, which is a Sunday. I'm just going to basically welcome everyone to the class and turn things over to all of you for whatever question you guys might have. And I would suggest asking questions that are going to benefit your life practice. The struggles and difficulties that I've had in this life, they can help you and you might have certain questions, certain things that you're challenged with that I'll be able to help you with based on the challenges that I had in this life. So thank you all for joining for today's class. I'll see you perhaps this Sunday, which is tomorrow, maybe on Wednesday, maybe next Saturday, or maybe all of those days. So we'll see you in a future class. Have a very lovely rest of your day. We'll see you next time. Sawadee Thank you for listening to this podcast. To provide support for this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha. To access more teachings, visit buddhadailywisdom.com. There, you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Remember to establish a daily, consistent meditation practice, along with learning and practicing these teachings. A well-developed meditation practice is the foundation in which to train the mind to attain enlightenment.